PL Talks uh, is a series of discussions with Alberta artists meant to encourage the arts and discussion about art. We are so very pleased to have for our third talk in the series Katie Owe, the renowned Canadian sculptor. Yes. Hey, Katie. Katie was, as many of you know, one of the first artists to make abstract sculpture in Alberta, and she's been a role model for women artists all of her life. Katie and her husband and partner, the outstanding painter and printmaker Harry Kioka, uh, have spent their lives as teachers and artists dedicated to the education, creation, and promotion of contemporary art in Calgary, Alberta, and Canada. To my amazement and delight, Katie accepted my invitation to come and chat with me about her craft and her singular take on kinetic sculpture. We spent hours discussing her work and her life as a pioneer female sculpture. I wish we could share it all. Katie, you've lived an amazing life. Born in 1937, sorry, <laughs> in uh, Piers, Alberta to immigrant farmers, Katie attended the Alberta College of Art, the Montreal School of Art and Design, the Sculpture Center in New York, and Fonderia Fabris in Verona, Italy. In her younger days, Katie studied with some of the world's best, and then she returned to her beloved Alberta to share what she had learned and her inspiration. Always work has been exhibited across Canada and internationally. In addition to numerous commission works installed throughout Alberta, her work is represented in the collections in many collections, including the Canada Council Art Bank, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, the Shell Collection, the University of Calgary, the Alberta College of Art and Design, and the Glenbow Museum. In 1991, she was uh, received the ACAD Alumni Award of Excellence. And in 2001, she was the recipient of an honorary doctor doctorate from the University of Calgary in recognition of her influence on art in Alberta. Katie is a fiercely beloved teacher and mentor of the arts. She taught sculpture at ACAD since, uh, beginning in 1970, and her students include many successful and high-profile artists with international careers such as Evan Penny, Christian Eckhart, Brian Cooley, Alexander Caldwell, Isla Burns, and more. So, yeah, <laughs> Kate, Katie was uh, elected as a member of the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts as an, and is entitled to use the RCA designation as acknowledgement of her contribution to Canadian art. Driven by the desire to be able to express thoughts and emotions through her work, Katie still works in her studio experimenting, planning, creating yet more new work. The tactile and kinetic nature of Katie's sculptures compel you to physically interact with them. For me, they are simply irresistible. I must touch them, I must spin them. Katie and Harry are the founders of the Kioka Owe Art Center. They selflessly work away at KOAC, uh, which in time will be a center fostering contemplation and creativity in contemporary art. One of the great experiences of my life has been to spend a glorious afternoon that spread into the evening with Katie and Harry at KOAC and to have a personal tour of their sculpture garden. I commend it to anyone and all people here. I ask you to join me in welcoming the great Katie Owe for a conversation. Now I said to Katie, 
Uh, one of the things I was going to do at the beginning of the talk was embarrass her. <laughs> because she doesn't like you to uh, describe her as fantastic, wonderful. <laughs> she, she likes to describe herself as having been fortunate to have met so many kind people. Um, it's true. True. Hmm. So Katie, in, in 1977, when I moved to Calgary, the law school at the bio, was in the Biosciences Building. Mm -hmm. And every day when we went over to Mac Hall for lunch or dinner, we had to pass by this sculpture of yours that I now know is called the zipper. <laughs> I expect that I speak for tens of thousands of U of C students who over the past 40 years gave Zipper a spin for good luck before exams or just for the sheer fun of it. Um, what I think is truly amazing about Zipper is this is 40 years old. So Katie, everybody here and many people through the gathering want to know what is the story of the Zipper? <laughs> Having the shape of an oval, I was really working with framing a space. And I could only imagine that space as having to be animated by either offsetting forms and space to animate the center core of the piece or to create spirals. And in having a spiral, one would be initiating the act of motion. But in this case, because I, I had undulated forms at an angle, I could only sort of fluctuate the space alternately this way. So in essence, you know, a simple term for the zipper would be be to say I'm creating an, a framed space. The surfaces are very, very smooth to induce touch and hopefully to provoke that before you think that you shouldn't touch. <laughs> <laughs> and then to touch, to, I think what you perceive through the motion doesn't, it isn't comprehensive immediately. You perceive it, but you don't understand it. And that understanding sinks in as you get more and more involved with the motion. I have to attribute a lot to, to Perks who located the sculpture in the science building because he, at that point in time, in 1975, it was taboo to place an object in a pedestrian area. And if you could imagine this piece being cornered and isolated somewhere, it wouldn't have the effect that it does where it exists. But coming back to its origin, it took at least three years to complete. And to be the to initiate the forms, it took a lot of model making and experimentation to be able to find out how I could create a smooth contour, a seductive shape. So I used prototypes, different materials, to initiate that before the idea of fabricating a shell in that form in steel came about. But so, uh, the, uh, hmm? the significant part about it is the tactility that, to induce or provoke touch before you really think, before it hits your mind, that you shouldn't. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to add at this point in time 
is that ground steel without a surface appears very heavy. Mm -hmm. So it required to be polished and chromed to become lighter visually and to create an illusion of weight. So, so Katie, one of the things that I've uh, observed with your help is that lightness, uh, uh, the illusion of not being heavy, mm. is something that you look for. I think it's really important. Color surface is really important to the work so that the color might or the surface reflects what it is. And then also to make the surface as tactile as possible to provoke touch and so. weight. So in chroming, I wasn't really aiming to make a reflective surface, but to lighten the, the sense of the form. Which takes us to monsoons, another piece designed for optical illusion. And so Katie, tell us a little bit about the series you call monsoons. The monsoons, because initially I, I had in my mind to work with cloud formations. And then I also thought to eventually to work white to reduce the sense of physical weight. And as well, the pouting, powder coating gave me a very, very tactile surface. But uh, to create this took a lot of fabricating. And in having created one and two of different sizes and placing the objects, the three layers in different positions to its center core. As I played with three, I started with three with the intent of only doing three. But then in having three, as they rotated, the space between individual monsoons would fluctuate. Mm -hmm. And then I imagined a roof, room full. <laughs> so I could work with the inner spaces. And I did create 17 pieces. Wow. So the art foundation, they have 10. And I, I continued to keep five. <laughs> so because I, I really like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but physically, in order to have the constant motion that is so essential to this piece, it, it's really created physically or technically by offsetting centers. So if you imagine the larger surface the, the center bulge, it's almost symmetrical to the center fulcrum, whereas the upper part, it's offset. Mm -hmm. And in offsetting this, it will always appear that the top and bottom work alternately with the part that's more centered. Mm -hmm. So the illusion is that they can't be connected physically, but they are, they're one form. I'd also like to add, in order to have this rotation, a constant rotation, because it turns for a long time, it has to be physically balanced. So within, on the, lighter side, or the heavier, the lighter side, I would be able to smell lead into that part of the inside of the form. 
So this one, in fact, is very, very well balanced. And for all of these reasons, I have to fabricate and use steel, metal, because the melting temperature of steel is way beyond the melting temperature of lead. And it, it, it's a, large, a big component of the movement. So, so I worked on these for about three, two, two years at least. So Katie, one of the things that you've shared with me is, is the name of pieces is really important to you. Yes, the title, it sort of evolves as you work. And I've always felt that the title should have in content, it should feel, I think, not to describe the piece, to, but to feel like the piece. And these do feel just monsoonish. <laughs> I also like the word monsoon in my mouth. <laughs> but uh, the title of the works is important. So uh, there's, on that, there's an interesting um, tale of the name of the next pieces. Hmm. See? Okay. <laughs> so, so I find it very interesting where you were and how y you were thinking when you uh, came up with the name of these pieces, because as you can see, there, there's many of them, not just. Well, the, if these came about almost immediately after the long time spent on the monsoons. But I did have some curved pipe and how to use that curved pipe. So I didn't really have a title at that point. I was doing something that might have to do with a kind of civilization uh, sort of place, and they were inverted the other way. But I couldn't imagine having another limb in the center if this should be inverted, and everything would be too equal. So, it, and as I was working, some bees fell from the window that's in the sun, <laughs> in my studio, and the bees would fall, they were de they dehydrated from the heat, and they would fall on the floor and spin, <laughs> inverted and spin. So these are called the weeping bees, which makes a lot of sense. I, I like the idea of weeping because it's really sad to see them on their backs spinning dehydrated, <laughs> almost gone. So they initiated the title of these pieces and also gave me the idea to invert them. But um, in this instance, because I don't have a balanced circular circumference, I couldn't achieve the motion that the monsoon has. So there's a very heavy lead washer sort of on the rotary system inside. And the hardest part in fabricating this piece was really to find the jointing system and make the transition from one limb into another very smooth and tactile. And then the question of color, how to I thought at one point in time, the color should be warm. So I worked with automotive colors, brown, and they became leathery. So that wasn't the solution. So, and this was all filed, this was polished. And then I, I went back to the primer and kept them gray, neutral, and then repolishing the tips and making the decision to make the tips as tactile as possible to induce again the idea to touch. 
but and this squeaks a little. <laughs> but that's okay. They have nothing to do with the squeaking, but something about the bearing system is causing a bit of friction, maybe. <laughs> but um, the round caps of the pipe ends was really, really important to induce, without thinking, the act of touch. So we have another one in your uh, stormy phase called typhoons. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I fiddle a lot in the studio with, the, with temporary materials. And the typhoon, they started with water hose. I would run wires through water hose, and the initial idea with the central spiral was to create a kind of knot so that that knot, as it rotated on the, on the arc, would appear as though the rotation was rolling up the arc. And I tried three different elements or three different configurations to make it appear that way. But then I couldn't physically balance this knot with lead. It, it would be, there was just no center point to be able to balance, to physically balance that form. And then my only solution is what we have. And this is a spiral. And the spiral, again, created an optical illusion if the spiral turns outward from the central uh, fulcrum point, it will appear as though it's getting bigger. The rotation, the other way, turning it inward, it will appear to become smaller. The whole intent of what I do is to create an optical illusion that perceptively the mind doesn't quite understand immediately. It takes a while to, to imagine what you're looking at and what is physically happening. If, if there's no optical illusion, the piece may as well stand still in my mind because stillness is as powerful as movement. So, in, in this instance, there are 12 typhoons, and the idea is that it should cover a floor, and the arcs can be random, they can form a larger circle, they, they can fall into any position that you want. <laughs> The next piece is a still shot, but I have to say that I, uh, I enjoyed going into your studio um, and I ended up playing with these as well. Um, the chuckles. Yes, the chuckles. And, and, and the, they go up and down, but it's an intriguing story for me about how um, some material ended up being chuckles. Well, it's interesting, in this case, they began with a stainless steel spring. I went to a scrapyard. In the scrapyard, in the mud, knee-deep in water, I found these stainless steel springs. And they have a height, so the beginning of the spring here and end of the spring here, they... I didn't have much of a range of heights, so I picked up at least a dozen of them, if not more, with no idea of how I could use them. I had the idea I would do something like this. But um, working with the springs, unfortunately, the springs are stainless steel. Stainless steel springs do not fatigue. Mild steel springs are bendable, they fatigue. But I think 
Also, I was limited to height. I would have loved to see one that tall, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so I tried to imagine how to use these springs. It took a while, a lot of experimentation with different prefab elements, either putting, giving it a cap or... I wasn't sure what it should be. Um, and then to try to take advantage, full advantage of the bounce of the springs. So I almost created another spring, but I could adapt a pipe cap. You can buy pipe caps. They're used in the oil industry to fit onto ends of pipes. So I could buy the pipe cap, but a pipe cap is very heavy. So a lot of grinding and smoothing it out, and I used the full height of that pipe cap. So I had the top, and then to sort of intensify the rings and having, because if you look at the rings, they're, they're made of straight steel rods. And so you have to make the circle. A lot of welding, a lot of filing, a lot of, so as soon as that the circle of the rings had just a little bit off center or buckle, it would be apparent. So it was really important that I could bend these circles progressively from sort of, to maintain a balance, a weight, and also a spatial arrangement. So I could weld here and the next set here next set here, the next set here, because there is a binding weld in the inside. So they, they come apart. You can lift them off the spring and the anchor. Then at the same time, the color, the surface was really, really important. To make the top and plus the rings as tactile, as possible, and also to work with a, with a, a what, the illusion the, that changes with the light. So uh, as they bounce and they're lit, the, the color changes. Every once in a while I see a piece of art that makes me cry. And when I saw this piece, at uh, out at uh, Katie's home, I, I was absolutely stunned. If you if you look at this piece, it's it's floating. It's um, it's it's truly unbelievable to be in the presence of this piece. Um, Deborah has um, uh, another version, I think, of one like this, um, but. Katie, please, please tell us while we've got some time here about horizontal loop because it's, I think it's a masterpiece. This was a piece that was built at Stuhart's and it, it's, I had some bent pipe, a spiral piece of pipe. And so there could be in each individual loop as many as 40 ends to be able to create a, a form that could be ultimately connected. I didn't want a loose end. And then to also have the loops, the two loops, sitting, coming up from a base. So the base has a, an anchor that's part of the pipe that I use to create the loops. And then the loops, they're really about how the very center core is positioned one on top of the other. 
the bearing and shaft is offset in each attachment, offset from the base and then offset on the individual loops. So as the pieces rotate, they will not look connected. If the loops were equally and centered, they would look as though they're connected. But the simple thing like offsetting the contact point creates an illusion of something that's not connected. The title came from the outer edge because I, I imagined the foothills and how as the loops sort of wander and almost touch and then open up, I imagined the sort of foothills landscape. And this too, it was one of the first pieces that were chromed. And if you've done any chroming, it's, I, I was very fortunate with Calgary plating. They, they loaned me the keys to the shop <laughs> <laughs> so that I could come and go and do the polishing of the metal. For the chrome pieces, I did all the polishing because I couldn't afford two, three weeks of polishing by somebody else and pay for that time. And I learned a great deal, but the foreman, he would keep coming along and he'd take his thumb like that, not good enough. <laughs> because if it wouldn't be polished well enough, it would reflect on Kelby plating. <laughs> so he not good enough. Yeah. And I would be black. Well, I would be this one, this one is also truly amazing, and um, the video doesn't do it full justice because it's actually quite tall. But this followed a trip to Japan, and I saw the sand sand gardens. And I think a lot of you have seen the sand gardens. And I think the Shinto um, form, it's heaven and earth. So it's a sand pyramid with breaking it around. And I think having seen that, the beauty of that and the meaning of that, it haunted me, and two years later, after returning to Calgary, this came about, but I didn't really connect the two. But I did play with, with pendulums, instead of inner pendulums, and then trying to bring them out of the center structure and using the rings around but they, the, so the pieces, the center core pieces would have to be absolutely symmetrical because I have an inner pendulum moving this way and another one moving this way. So that the two moving either this way or that way create optically a sense of moving around, hopefully. Almost. Ah, uh, does it? So this is a welded form, and that was a little bit of a nightmare. <laughs> because I, I couldn't quite imagine the height of it. And initially, it only came to about that height. And then I would imagine the rings and the pendulums, and they would move too fast. They were too fast, too erratic. And then I raised it again, topped it off, raised it, and that should be perfect. But again, it didn't quite. And I wanted it to be much more subtle. So then I raised it again, and it became this, what I call a hill, but it's a little bit of an exaggerated hill. It's, it's tall, 
but it did slow the movement of the pendulums and sort of, it, it, they're very, very subtle, not jolty. Now, one of your, um, I'm a little too far ahead here, this one. Oh. One of your masterpieces, as far as I'm concerned, is the piece you built for the Esso building. Hmm. And this is a, a real challenge for the space. Tell us about the, the actual building and what you had to do to make this piece. With commissions, I, you need a team. And the team, these are technical people that are masters at some of the techniques that you're going to use for this piece. And then being a commission, I've always felt that the commission should relate to the context of where it should go. So this is earth probe, or it could be a pendulum, which is a common tool used in the old industry. So then to have this pendulum or this plumb bob, sorry, this plumb bob configure the, it configures a plumb bob, which is a tool that's used in the industry. But at that idea also lent itself to the location and to the shape of the inner space of the ESO research building. For instance, at the base of this piece, it's a traffic, a four-way traffic area. So the bottom had to be thin, so you wouldn't, it wasn't an obstacle tripping up the traffic. And then the building is high, a five, level building is very high and slender. And then there are different levels where you look out into the center core in which the piece is, so that <laughs> it had to sort of be interest, interesting from the different heights of the visual area of the space. It also had to be tight at the bottom it also, for me, I wanted some movement within the piece. So, and the movement is also, it, it's in the same, at the same level as the second level of the entrance. You come in and you see the rings are oscillating off that entrance point. <laughs> but the construction of the piece, I needed, I was fortunate, a friend, was an aircraft engineer, a brilliant, precise aircraft engineer. And then I also had a technician who was a welder first, became a sculptor and a, a perfectionist. So the combination of Philip and, and uh, George and myself, there were three of us working together. It was a little bit of a nightmare because the deadline was tight. And some of the aircraft materials used to construct this came from California. So there was a delay in the shipment and then a missing, some of the materials were missing that we needed. So the total piece, was technically built. There was very little fabrication involved, except you had to construct and build everything. There's a center hollow core that we built that it double surfaced. And when you do an inner surface and an outer surface, you, it's a structural element so that it can't move or shift or break or bend. So the inner, this form, the two cones, they, they were built. We built a lathe to accommodate that shape. 
and then fiberglass. A, surf, a fiberglass surface inside, a fiberglass surface on the outside. And then the surface, the color was composed of rock and epoxy. And we buttered that onto the surface. And the epoxy would dry soon enough so that once this part is done, we could rotate it and hopefully it didn't fall off to do the other side. <laughs> and then, because wanted it to look like rock, we had to engrave into the surface and again inlay other rock to get the effect of rock. Because the whole idea for this piece was to make it appear as though it would be brought into the earth and reflect that the structure of the earth and pull it out. The rings around the center core, they haven't stopped moving. They altered, the movement is alternate. But within the center core, it needed a magnetic system and it's a military magnetic system, very, very powerful. The magnets, they were shaped like a finger, large magnets. You could hold them here, and you couldn't bring your arms together. So very strong military magnetic magnetics. And this was attached to a computer. So once the rings... They, they oscillate and then as they come to, they slow down and they're almost stopping, the magnetic system gives it a pop. Wow. So they haven't moved or they haven't stopped unless there's a power shortage. <laughs> for, and this was installed in 1991. So we have um, we have two more still shots that we'll just quickly let people. I'm taking too long. No, <laughs> no, no, no. So um, this is a piece on the grounds of uh, Sade or ACAD. Um, that was a commission. And you can tell us about your inspiration for it. Some people here may very well guess. From so the this image. was commissioned to uh, through the master's gallery by the college to commemorate Janet Mitchell. And I think a lot of you are familiar with Janet Mitchell. And she was a painter way ahead of her period of time. And she worked with broken elements in her paintings. And I thought to commemorate her, I would like to use elements that she used in her paintings so that you retain some reflection of her. Whereas structurally, I couldn't fragment my stars, I couldn't fragment the crowns, but you would see elements of crowns or stars in her paintings. So that's, that was the context of this sculpture. Also, I had visited Venice, and a lot of you have been to Venice, and you see the, the wells in Venice, in the piazzas, and people sort of accumulate around the wells, well. So there is a little bit of that idea in this piece too, to do a centerpiece that might bring people, gather people around it. And then, yeah, we have the crown. If you imagine taking that kind of crown and flattening it. As you flatten it, you have a star. And so in a way to sort of reflect again on her paintings and how she could scatter her elements around her composite. I thought I could then place the stars flat on the ground to reflect the sky. 
the, the vessel that contains the crown is rotary. And I remember Ron meeting me when we, I had car, cardboard templates to be able to figure out where these stars should be surrounding the crown. And we stood on the parkade and looked down on these <laughs> stars. And I think I sustained a lot of the positioning that you said, that's good, move that one over there. <laughs> so, so we'll just go to our last slide here. This is a beautiful thing. Uh, this sculpture was commissioned for the University of Calgary, and it's in the Swan Park. It took a long time to evolve a concept that I could relate to a place of learning. And what is it? Is it a book? Is it? And then right next to where this piece should be located was a prairie chicken. So I couldn't, in my mind, I had to do something completely unique so it wouldn't, in scale or size or in concept, it couldn't really be, it had to be entirely different from its neighbor. And then as I started working on this piece, there was also a pool in the, within this area. But the donor for the pool, he backed out, so there was no pool. <laughs> so then we were back on the land. <laughs> so trying to work out concepts and ideas for this location took over a year. I played with different forms, and fortunately, they weren't in a hurry. <laughs> but to this day, I feel that for commissions, you need almost a greater time for the concept than you would need for the realization of that concept. Because you have to think it, it has to be unique, it has to fit the context of where it's going. And that takes time because it takes you right out of where your mind might be evolving pieces within your studio. It takes you to another place because of the context. So it's very, very difficult to switch from here into an entirely different way of thinking and seeing and doing. It's related, but the, the context is different. So this is the Garden of Learning. I have the Tree of Learning and the Root of Learning and the Cradle of Learning. And all the three elements, they were rotary. So the height of the piece is 18 feet. I needed an anchor for the vessels to sit on. And that's an, sort of, I think of this as the internet connectiveness, communication connectiveness, that part. But the... The bearing systems and shafts, they rest on the rim of the piece. And the rim, the circle that on which the vessels are mounted, is about 18 feet across. It's huge. And again, I had George, the technician, working with me. So the two of us, we spent hours and hours, days, nights <laughs> working to be able to complete this piece, very complicated. The, the tree is 18 feet high and it continues to have its rotary system. It will move in the wind. The, the root of learning on the flatter piece, it has to be manually turned the cradle, which is this form, it ha we had to remove the rotary system because of danger. Someone could come up and swing it. And <laughs> 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 so 
<laughs> that's 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 a wonderful thing to go and visit. So uh, we're we're back to where we began. Special thanks to all of you for coming. It makes everybody on our team really happy to create this opportunity for you to spend time to get to meet Katie Oe and hear about her marvelous kinetic sculptures. Thank you, Katie.